Uh, here we go. So um, welcome, everybody, to the Unfuck by Design podcast. I'm Jackson, one of your hosts, and this is a podcast created for designers, entrepreneurs, and creative visionaries, helping design better things across borders and time zones. In this podcast, we'll play with design techniques, gain insights from industry experts, and tackle real-world design challenges. But aside from all this, I'd, I'd really like to hope that we can actually contribute to a better future by design. So with all that said, let's dive into it. I'm fucked by design. JJ, I'll let you introduce yourself. So JJ, the founder of um, Leonardo AI. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm JJ, as Dave said, the founder of, uh, well, one of the founders of Leonardo AI. There are actually five co-founders, including myself. And uh, yeah, I, I have, um, I guess, a bit of a history in, in, in founding tech startups, but um, you know, this is definitely, I think, the the most um, the most exciting thing I've I've been involved in. And uh, as you sort of say, it's it's really uh, I guess generative AI is sort of the topic you know on on everyone's lips at the moment. So yeah, it's super exciting space to be to be in. Super excited to have you here. It's um really really a, 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 an exciting first topic. So I think um, we should probably just take a second to to uh, explain how we got here who we are and how we got here before we dive in. And um, I think, you know, for, for me, as your host on this one, Dave and I, throughout these this, this series of podcasts, we're probably going to bounce backwards and forwards from you know, being uh, host and co-host. Uh, we set this thing up together. And, um, you know, but in, in this instance, Dave's probably going to be helping me more as a producer. To, to bring things up as we need them, information we might call on to, to help people understand uh, what we're talking about. Um, but look, me, my name's Jackson, as I said in the intro, but I've, I've been in the industry for a long time. I'm a designer, uh, a, a product strategist, and, you know, for this thing, I'm, I'm the host. But like, like I said, uh, you know, for a long time, you know, churning out products and projects, you you get this craving to actually put your, your skills to good use, you know, to actually, especially once you've had kids, you know, so I've got uh, twin sons and, and uh, you know, they're 16 now and, and they're very aware of what I'm doing and what I'm putting out into the world. And so we've become very conscious of that. And, and I want to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm, I am putting those skills to good use and, and yeah, you know, especially having some fun doing it. Right. So that's me. I'll hand you over to Dave to introduce himself and yeah, we'll kick on. Thanks guys. Yeah. So Jackson, you and I met uh, maybe three years ago now when, um, you know, we decided to work on a couple of projects together. Um, at that time you were, we were going through some design sprints. Um, I was the, I guess you could say produced back then. Remember I was, you know, capturing the footage. Um, we were planning on, um, you know, marketing these products at the time. And, um, you know, we always had this idea of running a podcast or having sort of these discussions. And, you know, we, we toyed with this idea for a while and it wasn't until, you know, at the end of last year when, you know, we started to play with ChatGPT, GPT-3 and started to have these meaningful conversations about, okay, um, this is big and this is cool and this is fun and what's going to happen and, you know, we started to play out these conversations in our mind of things happening over the next couple of years and had no idea that things were going to happen in the next couple of months. And so, so we're like, this is a perfect time to actually put into practice what we've been talking about for all these years and let's start having these conversations and let's start, you know, um, designing things and solutions and trying to solve problems and, yeah, making um, this an inclusive collaborative conversation that works for everyone. Yeah, cool, cool. And look, I think that's probably a good point to, to zoom in on just reestablishing what this is about. And I suppose over time, and just, yeah, I, I suppose a caveat, uh, this is our pilot, right? Like we're, we're gonna stumble, we're gonna fall, we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit of fun with it. But, um, you know, I think that's the primary goal for us, right? We wanna learn, we're here to learn, not to, to, to just teach. We do have a lot to share. But that's what we're here for, right? Like we want to talk to really cool people and learn great stuff, so we can do a better job as uh, as designers and creatives. So, um, the the mission statement as it stands for this podcast, 
empowering creative visionaries to become better agents for an acceptable future for humanity by exploring cutting edge design techniques, fostering collaborative uh, collaboration across time zones and sharing insights from industry experts. We're committed to developing innovative solutions that positively impact uh, people and planet while sharing the process. Together, we'll tackle tough questions and strive for actionable outcomes. So that's our uh, mission statement as it stands. And what I'd like to also uh, make sure people are aware of is that we plan to run these sessions in two parts. So on a fortnightly basis, uh, each Friday, I would say every Friday, but on a fortnightly cycle, first Friday is going to be these conversations where we dive deep with, uh, with, um, you know, professionals, um, on specific topics. And then the alternating Fridays after that, we're going to be running live workshops, live design sessions where we can actually, uh, you know, get our hands dirty and dive deeper into using the technology or, um, using the design techniques, uh, you know, learning by, by actually doing, you know, so, um, that's the actionable outcome component of this. Right. And so a big part of my job is, is as a, uh, facilitator and designer is to help teams to, you know, align on what it is they're trying to do, the problems they're trying to solve and then designing solutions for them. And so I'm hoping we can, you know, through these conversations, you know, identify problems that need to be solved in the real world and, and zoom in and solve them. Right. Like, uh, and look in saying that I'm not going to waffle on anymore. Let's kick on to the next thing. So Dave. Yeah. So, um, let's hand it over to Dave, JJ and just let him give us JJ, if you'd mind, would, wouldn't mind, give us an introduction into sort of, um, Leonardo, how you came to uh, be interested in generative AI and what's the inspiration behind founding the company? Yeah, sure. Um, so it probably helps to sort of take a step back and just give you an idea as, what I, as to what I was um, what I was doing, I guess, uh, you know, prior to Leonardo, and which which was I, I co-founded a, a Web three gaming studio called Rainy Studios, and um, um, there, I guess, our, you know, we, we entered the, the Web3 space in 2021 and at the time, sort of not dissimilar to today, um, there was a real, uh, I guess, lack of strong gameplay experiences in the Web3 space. And so, um, you know, most, most games were um, not much more than glorified excuses for interacting with the blockchain. And uh, we, we felt that we wanted to bring, you know, strong, strong gameplay and production values uh, to, the, to the gaming space in, in Web3. And so um, I had a lot of friends in the Australian gaming, um, gaming space and, you know, we put together an awesome team. And, and from there, it was sort of the, you know, how the studio got, got, got started. And uh, in, in running, like, so my role there was sort of I was running production on the gaming side and, and in, in doing that, um, you know, obviously I, I was involved on content creation um, and started to see a lot of the challenges around the content creation process, you know, finding finding good artists, um, consistency and quality of output, uh, things like, you know, time to delivery and cost and so on. And, and so really started to explore the idea of leveraging generative AI because personally I'd been quite interested in the space ever since, um, well, even sort of a number of years back, Google Deep Dream. I don't know if you guys remember that. But um, that was you know, sort of super trippy, fun stuff. And uh, I, um, I played a lot with that because, like, personally, I'm not someone who's got great technical artistic skill. I can take a photo. I can't, like, I can't draw for shit, like, to be honest. You know, like, like it's, it's, not, it's not, my, um, not within my technical skill set, although I've tried and, you know, done all that sort of stuff. Um, but so, so I found generative AI super fascinating and... Um, you know, I actually like created some, some awesome pieces from photos I'd taken and I actually sold them at festivals and stuff like that. And so, so that was sort of my, my initial foray into generative AI. And so I've been tracking, you know, what's been happening in that space over the, you know, preceding years and, um, um, with things like Disco Diffusion, which was really popular prior to Mid Journey coming out, then Mid Journey came out and, 
Um, so got to doing some experimentation with generative AI there and, and could see the real potential, but also a lot of the friction around actually leveraging generative AI within a, a real content creation framework, like, um, you know, putting a text prompt into, into a model and getting something back is really only part of, you know, what's, what's involved. Because if you think about the creative process, especially in something like, like gaming, you really need a lot of control. You need to be able to stick to a certain style. You need to be able to iterate on concepts or ideas. You need to be able to sort of take it through a creation like workflow or pipeline. It's not just text prompt and you're done, you know? And, and, and so we could see sort of the potential, but also like limitations. And um, I got to chatting with, with a couple of people um, who had been very involved in the Disco Diffusion open source space, uh, Ethan and Sammy, who are both co-founders of Leonardo. Mm -hmm. And um, they, so Ethan actually wrote a guide called A Traveler's Guide to Latent Space, which was sort of like the seminal guide on how to use Disco Diffusion. He goes super deep. And then he forked Disco Diffusion to something called Mathrock Diffusion, um, which Sammy had helped him on. And anyway, so I got to chatting those guys about the prospect of working on something sort of focused on content creation, leveraging generative AI and, you know, with a particular focus on game asset creation. And, and they were super excited, obviously, at the prospect of working on that. Um, I got the blessing of the studio co-founder to sort of step back um, from my production role at, at Brainy and, and really sort of try and drive um, the Leonardo project. And so that, that was sort of in, I guess, August, September last year. Um, did you say that the, the company was Bra Brainy, did you say? Rainy, Brainy Brainy Studios. Yeah. Brainy like, Studios. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Try so what was, what was your, your role again with, with Rainy? I was running production. Okay. <clears throat> gotcha. So, cool. um, yeah. So from there, uh, we, I brought on board a couple of other people, um, which was, it was Jake and who had worked with me before at, a fin, at the FinTech that I co-founded the same founder from the studio. He'd run an operations there and, um, and Peter, who's our CTO, he, he had done contract work on the infrastructure side for the studio as well. And so it was sort of like the founding five members of team and, and really, I guess our, um, our, our view with respect to, you know, our thesis was one, we really wanted to address sort of points of friction around leveraging generative AI for content creation. Two, we really wanted to bring more control throughout the entire process to actually, I guess, you know, people have been sort of afraid of generative AI as sort of replacing them or stealing their job, et cetera. But we think that keeping humans at the center of the creative process and really augmenting their creative abilities is a far more sort of valuable proposition. Um, because if, you know, if, if we outsource all creativity to machines, we're going to get stuff that's very derivative. Um, if we keep humans at the center of that process and we really give them control throughout it and allow them to sort of extend and augment their skill sets, I think, um, you know, the future looks much more interesting. And so that's sort of, I guess, key to how we're building out the platform. And the third part was um, we didn't want to just be sort of a, an application wrapper on top of open source tech, you know, obviously we leverage a lot of open source tech in the platform, but we also wanted to build our own defensible um, tech. We also wanted to innovate and do R and D, I guess, you know, into, into various aspects of um, the problem that we're looking to solve. And, you know, with Ethan and Sammy being deeply passionate ML engineers, that was always going to be part of our DNA. And so um, that's sort of very high level. Um, fast forward to today, the, the platform, obviously um, we have a lot of, um, you know, decent traction at the moment. We started to get some coverage um, in February from a couple of small YouTubers, which really blew up from there and snowballed. And I think we're almost, we're, no, we're, we are over half a million users on board at the platform now. That's We've got amazing. something like 50 to 60,000 daily active users. Um, and and how, how, uh, what's, what's the time period we're talking about here? From, from when you launched? Um, well, okay, yes. Yeah, so we launched early access December 23rd. Um, yeah. We had about, I think at the time, you know, we, we had a, we sort of built up a, pardon me, a bit of a um, early access list of about 20,000 people or so. Mm. And then sort of, you know, from there it was, I guess, you know, gradually, gradually growing. But then in February, a couple of YouTubers who had got early access to the platform just started sort of talking about us and, and posting videos. And, you know, we hadn't paid for any of that or anything like that. It was purely organic. And they were very small YouTubers, actually, only a couple of thousand subs each. But their videos, you know, I think they, they were like, one of them was like um, a bit clickbaity, the headline. It was like, oh, Leonardo, is it the mid-journey killer? 
and and so from there, I think that video got like <laughs> one hundred thousand views, and then sort of it sort of snowballed from there, and all the all the it other definitely things. definitely I'm helps uh, to have those uh, at least somebody post those clickbaity titles. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not complaining not doing them myself. <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, I mean, I mean now I think um, we're. I think we're in the top 20 Discord servers in the world as well, which is pretty cool. That's incredible, man. That yeah. really, really is. So pretty, pretty short space man. of time. Um, we've, we've, we've gone from, <clears throat> from, you know, um, from just launching to, to having a huge number of users and, uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. It really, that really is. I mean, mid journey, I mean, that, that, is this, um, an API that you, um, lean on? Um, no, so yeah, we we have our own entirely our own infrastructure stack on the back end. Wow. Um, yeah. We leverage as part of our um, as part of our you know overall creation um, workflow. We leverage the stable diffusion foundational model. Stable we also have our own model pipeline in there as well. So you, if the, so you've got Prompt Magic V two on on the left there. That actually that's actually our own. Um, it's a bit of secret sauce. I won't go into too much detail, but basically there's our own. Um, custom model that is, that is not a stable diffusion model um, that feeds into our stable diffusion rendering pipeline. Sure. And so um, that gives greater prompt adherence. Um, and yeah, so essentially what happens is that feeds into, um, so when you select a model and you have prompt magic V2 on, mm -hmm. that sort of feeds into that, that pipeline and, and you know, it gives you much better prompt adherence. And if you were to use um, uh, sort of the straight model with, without, without the prompt magic V2 on. Yeah. That's so cool. Wait, and and for, for the creatives out there, right. Cause I mean, I, I think everyone is at different stages going through, um, these, uh, these stages of, uh, you know, acknowledging that AI is now, or, or, um, you know, large language models are now, um, not going away. They're just getting better and better and that they are affecting their roles. And so you go through this sort of this pendulum, especially as a creative of panic, acceptance, panic <laughs> acceptance. Yeah. yeah. But for me, that probably started maybe about six, six years ago, right? Like, um, when I started seeing, um, automation move at the pace it was and just imagining what that meant. But, um, but I, I feel like I've gotten to a point like you where, um, you know, I see it, it, you know, at least, at least now, um, it enhances my creativity, you know, so I'm using it as a, um, it's like, I've got a co-designer all the time. So I'm bouncing ideas backwards and forwards. And then I'm, I'm very, you know, in fact, I'm, I'm never using an output except, except for say, if I'm doing a prototype or a wireframe and I just need to yeah. put something in there that's indicative of the outcome that I'm hoping to, to achieve. I never um, use something that's just created by an AI. I'm, I'm interacting with it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm playing. I'm yeah, playing I mean, because, you know, forward. like, like, because you can take the view that, um, like, you know, AI is very powerful on its own, right? But what's more powerful than AI on its own is human using AI to augment yes. their skills, right? Because that's, I think, as I said before, um, if you, if you really want to get the most out of these, these models, you need to be, you need someone to be driving that. Otherwise you're going to get very sort of derivative outputs. You need that sort of, that's right. Um, you know, well, it serves as a really good placeholder as well. Like, so helping for, um, say, you know, briefing, whether the creative process, like if you're trying to convey maybe a concept or an idea inside your mind of what you think something might look like, you might be able to, you know, I guess this is the concept in design of like, uh, you know, lo-fi, wireframes right um and you know perhaps perhaps it can do that as well but i was more thinking from the context of say either photography or setting a scene or a background like i was trying to do prior to the show we were coming up with like a podcast background so i had this image in my mind of my ideal podcast studio what how i would like to you know um, build something over time and it was pretty cool and then to be able to then use that as inspiration as that's what i want to that's the pieces that I want to start putting together. So it serves as a really good placeholder and um, can probably fast forward that step. So if you imagine you had a team of people, um, the way you had to sort of say, hey, I want you to go and do this and you need to go out and like um, collect, you know, props or I'm talking about like say photography or something here. Um, you have to go and collect props. You have, you know, we want to 
um, this sort of scene to be set with, um, you know, in a warehouse, want some red bricks and it's got to be this dark cinematic lighting. Um, they go out and, you know, organize it, do the shoot, and it's just not quite right. And you've got to go backwards and forwards, but you're able to just conceptualize this, put it into something like, you know, Leonardo or an AI image generator, say, I want something that looks like this, go and do it. And they can probably get it right in the first time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah. not just right, better. You know, Better, um, yeah. and that, and that's the hope. Like, I mean, none of us really, you know, they're, they're, I think there's definitely um, there, there's things to be wary of moving forward. There's no doubt, but I mean, that's where I'm at with it currently. It seems to be this um, uh, the, this this tool that I'm bouncing off, and and it and it takes it also takes discipline to learn how to use it properly as well. Like, you know, you just sort of see people interacting with these tools, and the first thing they do is you know, with a, with a language model is, is, you know, get it to write a poem, you know, on a, on a silly topic, you know, it's like, you know, and then it's like, it's just like when somebody hands you a microphone and says, say something and you just go, um, you know, it's like, it takes, it takes time to figure out how to use the tool. Right. But I think where, where I was going with that was, and this is probably for the, the content producers and the creatives bring them together, you know, for the creatives that are worried, and the content producers that are um, that are prompting these these tools, would you think that it would um, you know these it, these teams would benefit from a designer or a creative being involved in the prompting process itself because they they actually know what terms and and um, to use within those prompts. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, if, if you're going to be using generative AI for um, design or creative purposes, you definitely want a creative or designer involved in the in that process, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. It's no brainer. Well, that, you know, you just, I just heard a lot of people sigh and just go wipe the sweat off their brow. <laughs> That's awesome. You know what I mean? Because it's like, honestly, there's people really worried about this, this stuff. I mean, but that, I mean that, that's what I was saying, though. I think that the it's most interesting when it's used for augmenting um, yeah. You know, and and you know, it, it could still be used, I guess, by um, you know, by someone else on the team to be like, oh, hey, this is the kind of thing we want, right? Yeah. Like as you as you like were sort a of mood saying, board like, almost. Yeah, like as a mood board. But I think that if you're actually getting to creating, um, you know, to 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 sort of dialing in or zooming in a bit further and and refining that, I think that's that's where you really need a creative person involved because um, people don't have sort of sophisticated visual language or design creative language who haven't been heavily d involved in in that process right they'll, they'll just be like at a glance oh those colors pop that looks cool but like you know if you if you haven't sort of spent a lot of time and actually you know have that sort of creative or designer skill set i don't see how you can sort of discern what's actually you know like good versus what's just like you know a bit of um what's what's the word it's sort of like you know, um, being wowed by by a fancy blockbuster movie versus like understanding what's actually like I don't know valuable and and, and you know thoughtful and, and I, I don't know. Do, do That's right. Actually, it's like once you've seen it, once you've seen right. enough. Yeah, yeah, once you've seen enough um, Marvel movies, like unless you're really really right into the um, the franchise, but yeah. once you've seen enough of them, they're all the same, right? So yeah. there's not a lot of creativity to it. Yeah. Yeah. A very simple, low production movie yeah. that is it's ult ultra creative and it comes down to the talent of the actors conveying emotions and and let's you know that's probably where you could introduce the topic of consciousness into this sort of AI um, discussion. But yeah, like an actor. They convey emotion, they draw us in, we feel the connection, we feel the emotion, and then it's a creative movie versus perhaps you don't get emotionally attached to a to a Marvel movie. I'm sorry for anyone that's in um, that, that is a massive Marvel fan. But um, yeah, like there's a topic of um, you know, artificial intelligence. Is it actually intelligence that doesn't have consciousness or does it? Um, and then that's maybe what the creative or the designer um, brings into this sort of secret source of prompting. It's like, you know, using a little bit of intuition, a little bit of consciousness to be able to, um, you know, generate something hopefully, beautiful. Hopefully a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you got to remember, ultimately, these models are a reflection of what they've been trained on, right? So mm -hmm. you train them in huge data sets that contain all sorts of different content, like, there's not enough like highly sophisticated, good content out there for the models to be 
um, you know, to, to reflect that they, they're going to, they, they've been trained on, you know, 5 billion plus images. If we're speaking about an image generation model and, and, you know, a lot of those are probably not that great or, you know, what happens when the models start being trained on the, on the images that they're trained on the, that they're yeah. So, so, I mean, so that, that, that's happening now too. That's that. So that's, that's a lot of what, um, I mean, there's, you know, if you look at, um, look at mid journey, that's a lot of what they're doing. They're, they're sort of reinforcement trained, like learning on, on, on their, on their outputs as well as the one, like the ones that have been aesthetically graded the best, those get fed back in the, there's some problems there though, because they use the text prompt pairings of those images to train with them. And the, the problem is that the text prompts don't always match up with what they're sort of showing. because they still have this issue where they'll have text prompts that are kind of unrelated to the content. And then that sort of feeds back into the, the model misunderstanding what it's trying to generate based on what you're asking for. So sometimes, so there is that sort of, sort of like, you need to hack the prompt to get you what you want, which isn't necessarily what the prompt says. And there's yeah. kind of like changing one word around, you can just sort of iterate on the same um, input seed and you can sort of see how changing single words can change things. And it can be the sort of process of it. Like it's still like an iterative creative process, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's so much um, complexity and nuance in the, in the, the, in that training process that, you know, um, I, I try and keep up and try and, and I feel like I've got a much further. This is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> what did you, what did you ask for that one? I think this one was, um, a, a blonde surfer girl from Switzerland holding uh, on the beach, um, walking a brown dog. A border collie. That was it. Yeah. Border collie, border collie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun. It's an absolute lot of fun. I tell you what. What, what hand was this in? Was this in Mid Journey or coffee or hand is pretty in? cool? Was this in Leonardo AI? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm not an expert on prompting, so I just had a lot of fun getting into there and trying to, um, you know, like I was just demonstrating this actually to a friend. So I was like, okay, just I was just describing her ideal um, day, and she was like, you know, I want to be walking a um, border collie on the beach and so i'm like okay and so i just sort of whip this up really quickly but yeah um i think I, there's a good one for the the creatives um out there that you know that um it probably um shows the need to learn how to prompt well <laughs> to be a good it, it probably <laughs> also i'm just thinking do you know which model you're using for the output um you should so, try um, some of the newer ones on there will be a bit a bit more um Probably a bit <laughs> For anyone who's listening and can't see, that prompt generated a blonde woman on a beach with a furry right hand. Uh, <laughs> looks like three heads, one of which is a human and a dog head on either side, and a um, and a, a, it's a it's a Labrador. That's not a border collie sitting to her right on the beach. But yeah, like we, we've seen the output, JJ, we know that it does much better than that. That's Dave's, that's Dave's handiwork. That, that, that was my prompting. Um, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing the other, other, other images. So like, you know, once, once you get into something, you know, like descriptive, like I, I couldn't believe the, the accuracy and quality of what I was imagining with one prompt with, um, you know, this sort of warehouse um, podcast studio with, um, cinematic lighting and it was just phenomenal. I was having so much fun with this. It was great. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 That. yeah. Great. Quality was great. Yeah, cool. Are you able to make the images bigger? Are you able to make them, um, uh, full screen? Uh, yep. I, I, just, way, Dave, I think if you make your window like a bit less wide, it'll show up in here a little bit more, like a bit taller. I think. Yeah. I'll, Cause if I open it up in preview, then you can see it. So I'll just do that while you guys are chatting. I'll just flick through some of the images. Yeah, but it's um. Look, while, while Dave's flicking through those, JJ, yeah, it might be cool to um. Like what? I mean, you you mentioned your secret sauce earlier. Um. Oh well, yeah. Well, let's let's have a look at some of these first. These are beautiful. Yeah, like yeah. this. You know, it's just. That's, and this was our, um, I was trying to come up with a podcast, um, uh, like mascot, um, friendly AI helping the planet. 
It, that one looks sort of terrifying still. <laughs> this one, yeah. yeah there's there's, there's another one. Them there. still smiling, coming for me. I'd be, yeah. I'll tell you what it does really well is like it obviously, like I put in a prompt um, for generating a podcast studio based in King's Landing in a Game of Thrones the scene. And, the background there. <laughs> yeah. Um, this isn't one of the better ones. There was a, there was a really good one. I was like, that's perfect. But yeah, look, um, you know, you, the, you get the, better. Your brother, these ones, these are architectural ones. Yeah. So the, going back to that topic of like, you, you, you know, it's to enhance the process. It's like, you're not going to, like, I don't imagine that this technology would replace, um, like architectural drawing period because it might not be, um, you know, to a standard that can be used for say construction. I had a discussion with my brother about this and I, he, he was a builder and, but for, um, inspiration for, for people to sort of, um, talk about what they want to envisage. Like, and I can imagine, uh, you know, having a floor plan, like having a, like the, the square meter meterage of a block of land that, um, you know, you've got to conceptualize what you might be able to put on this, um, block of land and like bring that to life and doing that really fast. And then being able to sort of go to the draftsman, architect, whatever, and saying, this is kind of what we're looking at. Can you please, you know, like generate something like this and, or, and, or it's like this, this concept of the lawyer that, um, like, you know, the AI isn't going to replace lawyers, but the lawyer who uses, um, you know, like GPT-4 will replace a hundred lawyers, the same mm -hmm. sort of concept I would imagine with like, say, um, an architect or a draftsman in, you know, that profession. And then those other 99 lawyers can just have a really sweet life, just driving around on jet skis and having yeah. long holidays. <laughs> you still there, Dave? Are you frozen? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm still here. Mike's frozen. Oh, he's frozen. Yeah. Wow. Oh, look, while well, Dave's, oh no, here we go. He's back. He's, he's back. back. He's back and he's blurry. <laughs> Dave, um, that's really cool though, man. That, that, um, thanks for spending the time and bring putting those together, those images for anyone that is listening. They've just uh, scrolled through some, uh, some images and potential use cases, I suppose, outside of gaming, because I mean, essentially your uh, uh, product JJ is, is built for the gaming industry. Is that right? Yeah. So, so I guess, um, you know, to, to that, um, you know, we've, we come at the problem from a, from a game um, content creation perspective. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, broader use cases, obviously that people are leveraging the platform for, um, across the you know, creative design art, um, sort of space, but yeah, um, I guess our, our, you know, driving or guiding light is, is game content creation, but, um, yeah, I, th I think the application is much broader and the tools that we're building are, you know, applicable across that, that broader landscape as well. So, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, um, bring it back to the, you, you mentioned some secret source earlier, right? Um, a, a model that, that you've created, like in terms of, um, that there are other platforms in this space, right? Maybe, uh, specifically for the gaming industry, maybe others, I'm, I'm not too sure, but you know, what, what would you say? It um, sets you apart from other platforms, similar platforms out there. Is there? Yeah. So, so I think um, if you look at our platform, I mean, we've got image generation is one piece, um, but it's sort of really the um, so there's, there's a couple of things we have. We have basically built a, a sort of a full two D creation pipeline, right? So it's not just straight text prompt your you know your your image. It's also um, thinking about how we actually give people sort of more control throughout the process. And so there are things like the ability to, um, you know, as I said before, give people more control before you hit the generate button. And, and so what, what that looks like is um, initially at the moment, uh, we've integrated something called control net, which allows you to pose characters how you want, or um, actually take an existing um, scene. Like it could be, you know, you're sort of doing podcast studios there. You could actually take, a room layout that you like, feed it in and create variations based on that existing layout and actually uses um, a depth model to get a depth um, map of that scene. And you can actually then sort of iterate on that and keep kind of the room layout, but then change it stylistically in any direction. 
Um, so things like that, but, but really what we're driving towards as well is the ability to actually lay out a scene entirely. So you could sort of be like, well, I want a person over here in this sort of pose like this. I want a table here. I want a tree here. I want, you know, that sort of thing to actually be able to, and the way that you do that is sort of just really roughly draw regions of this, of the scene, sort of label them and say, I want these oh. things to be these things and feed that into the model. And that would give you back sort of a, essentially like a composable scene. And gotcha. from there. You could say, okay, cool. I'm, you know, say I'm happy or not happy with this. You could take it over into like the canvas editor and sort of do further work on it. You can mask areas or draw on areas and actually have the AI sort of assist you in, in sort of editing that kind of think of, think of like a AI driven Photoshop. I was about and, to say that. Yeah. yeah. And sort of, so you sort do of have a canvas area in there um, where you can actually continue to draw. Yeah. Like I, I can there. show you um, if, if I can share my There's screen. one question I did have was um, yeah. about vector output, like the tools that I've played with so far don't seem to offer that. I mean, is that. Something yeah. So we're, we're looking at, um, at vector conversion. The problem is that like the diffusion models are all sort of, um, yeah, it's all pixel based. So we get a pixel based output. Yeah. The challenge is converting that to vector, um, mm. in a, in a sort of a consistent Fun challenge to solve that one though like i mean because I, I i haven't done my the research i've done is limited but um from the tools that i've played with it's been the one thing that i've been looking for um you yeah, know, it's, then, it's, I've, then i've upgraded and been disappointed that i still can't do it you know and uh like I, I can take those images and turn them into vector quite quickly in another tool you know um like you know illustrator or, or something like that but yeah like, um yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a tough problem to solve. So what, what I'll do here, I'll just show you a little um, video example. Awesome. of. Um, so here, here, this is sort of like the, like a, a microcosm of how you might solve game assets sort of game content creation um, as an example. So he was sort of working on a, I guess, candy crush meets Tetris type game. And, you know, we want to create the little jellies. So we're actually starting with a, with a little sketch, like a blue blob, red blob, green blob, and so on. And we're trying to generate the sort of fruit candy gummies that form part of the game. And so we've got a text prompt, fruit sugar candy gummies feeding in this, this image. And so we run that in and we can generate, you can see these little, these little sort of gummy assets that can be used within the game. Wow. And, and from there we go, okay, cool. Let's say we like one of them. Um, we can click, you know, remove background. It's like a single button backgrounds and removed. And that's basically an asset that you can sort of drop into unity and use as a visual asset in game. Um, then, then let's say, you don't want to generate the, the background for the game again, sort of simple process. We're using one of the fine tune models. that's great at game asset creation. Um, this is an entrance to a candy themed kingdom. So we can run multiple variations of that very, very quickly. And then we can say, okay, cool. We kind of like this one. Let's feed that back in and create variations based on that image. And so from there you can go, okay, cool. Let's, let's get lots of variations on this entrance to a candy themed kingdom. And then we might say, okay, cool. We like one of these, but we want to edit it further. So we click and edit. Can you canvas. prompt on each of those so at the same, like, can you go deeper with a prompt or? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You can change a prompt and do whatever you want. Yeah. yeah and we, you can use something as original, original as an inspiration and then change more from there. And then from here, yeah. we're, in, we're in the canvas. We go, okay, cool. We want to actually extend this and we sort of extend the top like, oh, okay. We want to actually add clouds at the top, you know, type in sky. We go, well, you know, that, that sky doesn't look great. Let's, let's make them cartoon clouds. Um, so you can sort of, you know, do that pretty easily. And then, um, we want to extend the sort of candy road at the bottom, same concept. Um, and you know, as I said, what we're really doing with this sort of canvas tool, um, it's sort of in its early days. It's, it's, it's really at the moment, it's just about in painting, out painting and masking. Um, but we're sort of very soon releasing an update to it, which allows you to sketch directly onto the scene, um, and turn your sort of sketches into sort of polished, um, you know, work that actually fits in with content that you already have on screen. So, um, so you could be like, oh, I want to add, you know, I want to add something here, or I, you know, I want to add a little bridge or whatever. You could just draw a little bridge, like really rough sketch, sort of with a couple of colors, yeah, and then, and then have it turn that into an actual like finished bridge that matches the quality and the the you know the the, the sort of color consistency and everything like that of the scene. So that that's sort of the idea, um, and then from there. Uh, I can share this tab instead. From there, um, we, you know, we've got Unity and Unreal integration, so you can sort of drop those assets. Everything in here was created in, in Leonardo, except for the text in about 20 minutes. You can drop those assets into the into a game that you've sort of created. And, you know, from there, you've got basically um, all the visual assets sort of um, quickly, quickly done in Leonardo um, for use in game.
sort of in that way, it's sort of a very rapid, um, you know, creation process, right? It is. That is sensational watching a professional do this. Yeah. yeah and um, I mean, there's a few other pieces I might just quickly run through that I think are interesting. Um, I guess I sort of spoke again about this this background, sorry, this this canvas tool. And, and so this is just another example of how you could use it to create and extend on landscapes. Um, and so this is these sort of two two landscape tiles were created with a fine tune model on the platform. Um, and and so you know again you can sort of very rapidly extend and ideate and, and so on using this and you know again when the tool is sort of more extendable or more extended um you can you know let's say you go i actually want really want to put a river here i want to add you know elements here and do to so on you can sort of draw that in and have it sort of finesse that for you and so on so i think that's um that's pretty interesting you know interesting in terms of like how we're thinking about the end-to-end -end process and then um, worth talking too about the um, 3D side of things, and, and for that, uh, see, I, I don't have... know much about um, Unity, but I mean, you, um, you might. I'm, I'm assuming that there's um, there's integrations that can be built on top of that that you might yeah. um, be building yeah, so... in you know in app integrations <laughs> where you can um, use these generative uh, models without leaving. Well, um, we still sort of, you drive the creative process on platform, but you can use the plugin in Unity or Unreal to, um, to actually sort of access your creations. Yeah. Um, although with this thing I'm about to show you, you could also do this within Unity Unreal itself. So this is sort of, um, we can take in a, a 3D model and we can texture the 3D model based on a text prompt. And so where's um, the 3D model come from? Sorry. Um, uh, oh, so uh, this, is, this is one that you might you'd provide yourself. Right? Sure. So we're starting with this sort of chunky knight guy. And, you know, this has been prompted for, uh, you know, a stunning image of a flame knight, you know, glowing with fire and gold, shiny metallic finishing. And so, so this is, this is that guy. Um, and and so that's you know, the, the prompt has um, uh, prompted the texture. It's prompted the texture. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. this is okay. like a, you know, red and green magical knight. Wow. And then, um, you know, we, we found that, that actually doing different kinds of foods works really well. So he, this is like a cheese knight. Blue cheese. <laughs> And um, you can run like like th these textures take about um, three four minutes to generate. So you can also run like preview ones, which just do one face. So you know we would try and like like he's a cucumber guy. You can see it's only done on one side. Um, oh, wow. he's, he's like a guy like a, a steak steak one. Yeah, he's a so steak, a beautiful steak, steak is the prompt on that. Beautiful steak. A beautiful steak. A beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful kale. kale. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's, 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 it's understanding a lot from um, you know uh, three words there. Yeah yeah yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. So, so I just thought that's, that's a, that's a, I really like the cheese guy. He's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm half French, so I love cheese. So. It kind of looks like a little, the cheese guy, like a little bit like an insect. He does, doesn't he? Cause he's got, yeah. the, he's got these little like antler things and he's got his little yeah. eyes, you know, and extra, extra weird eyes. And that battlefield eyes stinks there. so bad. Yeah. It would, man. Uh, <laughs> especially, you know, once he, once he's cut open and he's oozing out his, his cheese in its yeah. Yeah, his inner cheddar. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool to have these like food um, ingredients, like characters, like be an interactive game for building recipes? Totally, it's good. And idea. then it turns into something. It's like you got to put the right pieces together. Yeah, like, you like, like, like smush the cheese. Like the cheese is fighting yeah. a baguette, and then he ends up inside the baguette. And then and then yeah, there's there's like the salamis over there. Yeah. You go get the salami, <laughs> smash him in. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it, man. I think it'd be great. But there, there, <laughs> so much to build that. <laughs> this is incredible, man. Like what you're showing us is really um, yeah. amazing stuff. And and you know, like like I said, we've uh, you know next Friday we'll be planning some some sort of, uh, you know, uh, interactive, um, engaging workshop, you know, where maybe we can actually use some of these tools and, and, uh, you know, and, and jump in and get our hands dirty, bring a, bring a cohort on to, to learn a little bit about the product. Yeah, that, yeah. that sounds cool. Um, I was, oh, sorry, you, you go, Dave, I was going to add one. I more. was going to say, Jackson, so like maybe, you know, like, cause that, that process then was very much around like, um, you know, like, really rapid prototyping for an in-game like asset right could we do something similar for you know like the the design process that you've taken me through before where you're rapid prototyping um you know ideas and concepts around little business models that we're testing yeah like, well, look well, well i think we're yeah we're, we're gonna have to zoom in on it and just um figure out you know what what those ideas might be and then you know we'll get a group of people together and we'll have some fun with it yeah i think um 
you know, that that's our goal for this the, the next four uh, weeks is to, to run two podcasts and two um, uh, two sessions where people can actually join in and get involved and and they may well be around the topic of generative AI. We'll, we'll see after this. But yeah, look, I'll invite you to the conversation after this, um, JJ, and we'll figure out what we might be able to come up with. Yeah, that sounds good. Some, yeah, I still got some really, um, uh, you know, um, great questions to, to ask you. So I might just kick on. Well, um, is there anything yeah, else that well, like like in if, the system? Like, if is it's there okay, to, that, yeah, yeah I'll, just, I'll just run through this one last thing, which, yeah, is, which I think no, is, is an interesting, just a really interesting feature and you know, it will be very sort of useful for people working in, in sort of design or, or, or creatives, um, which is that you can train, you can fine tune a model on your own visual content and you don't need very much of it to do that. So if you have, let's say you're an artist or you're a creative um, or a designer or anything like that, when you have, a, you, have, you have sort of like a body of work of some sort, be it, be it like, um, you know, prototypes or be it, um, so be it drawings or be it photos, anything like that. You can take those, that content in and you can fine tune them all on that very easily on, on the on platform. So basically this is just an example where we use sort of 14 cards from, from the, from the game that Rainy Studios is developing called the Lords of Light. Um, and you can basically upload them. You sort of drag and drop them to the data set images box. You click train model. You just set a couple of quick things about it, you know, quick, like name, model, description, etc. Click start training in about 15 minutes. Um, you can then use a model to generate content that's stylistically consistent with your training data. And and so if you think about, um, you know, an artist who has a particular style, they can train a model on their style and then they can go and create more content um, sort of consistent with their style. That's amazing. Or, is, is it actually still leaning on the a broader data set, a broader model exactly. as well? Yeah, so, so what it's doing is it's leveraging the broader data set for its semantic understanding of different terms. Okay. But then what you're doing is you're pulling it in the direction of your style. Sure. So you can essentially leverage its semantic understanding in combination with your stylistic um, sort of particulars. And, you know, that model is, of course, wholly your own. It's not... Um, it's not shared with other people unless you mm -hmm. want to make it public on the platform as well. So it's like you know, it's your private model. It's interesting. You can, could you could you switch it. switch off the 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 access to the public model and just have train it on your own? Um, no, because you would need um, uh, you would the need semantic train, understanding. You need the semantic understanding. It's like it's not yeah. going to know what a tree is unless it's been trained <laughs> on sure. thousands and tens of thousands of images of trees, basically. So that's the idea. You, you leverage the foundational model, which has yeah. that strong semantic understanding. Um, that's really cool though. That's, you know, and and you, yeah. you tune it with your, your smaller subset. Yeah. And that's what I did that with the architectural drawing. So that's when I really were able to time hack that productivity process just simply by once I discovered that data set, I, I pulled, you know, there's only so many, um, like real images of Hampton style houses that, cause it takes so long to, to build a house, right? So as I mentioned, brother's builder, he's got, you know, um, portfolio of a couple of houses, um, certain angles, blah, blah, blah. And I was able to then feed them in as the data set trained the model and then just spit out so many more variations, which can be, you know, either used for inspiration, like, uh, you know, content, social media, whatever it is for. What was um, his reaction? To the uh, yeah, impressed, impressed. He had a concern, like, so it wasn't about the AI, it was just about um, being genuine. So, you know, like he wanted to showcase, uh, you know, like real, um, you know, real craftsmanship because obviously, you know, a, a house is a tangible thing. And, you know, uh, his point of difference was, you know, quality assurance and, you know, high-end finishes. And how can you illustrate that with, you know, an, a not a genuine image, not a real image. And um, my take on that was like, okay, you've got two different um, perspectives to look at here. You've got the um, portfolio side, which is your actual finished projects, and then you've got your inspiration. So then, you know, you want people to be able to be inspired about what they want to do. And then how can you encourage them to sort of lean into the technology yeah. that you're using to, you know, like inspire like these, these ideas? Yeah, it's it's kind of like, um, you know, he, here's a style book tell me yeah. what are these do you like? And then you can use that to inform what they're actually going to architect and create and build, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. versus like, here's what I've actually built.
Mm. That's right. And then like, cause people then might go and um, skittle around the internet looking for, you know, other inspiration and they might see something they really like, but then that might be tied to another uh, builder, another architect that exactly. goes down. You want to keep them, keep them within your ecosystem. That's right. That's right. That's Sorry. Your... And then I thought about the concept of actually, you know, like, cause you think from the, the lens of, um, marketing, like what was really successful for like all the banks in um, Australia, at least um, from, from being you know, an Australian was having these calculator tools on the websites. What, you know, like also sites like Finder and whatnot, you know, for comparing insurance and stuff. There are all these calculators where you can just go in there, you punch in something and it spits out a result and it's like, hey, cool, you enter in your email and then you go down this process of, you know, that's how they use, they acquire a customer. So I was like, well, wouldn't that be super cool for, um, you know, something like a construction company where, um, you know, you have a tool where you can just put in your inspiration, what you what you want, and it spits out something and, you know, you've got to sort of, you know, like... Based on some... their existing portfolio. Well, so, no, 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 to attract... Uh, attract but that's what I'm saying, like, it could yeah. be um, the, the, the data set is trained on their existing portfolio, the yeah. customers putting in new images of the things they like, it's mixing yeah. them together and then spitting out. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Just as like that's a lead, right. So lead like, gen sort of um, it's a lead, uh, yeah, a method for using lead gen. So hmm. you know, like, can you combine that then with another tool? Like, I have no idea about coding. So how could I use GPT four to help me code a, a, a plugin in JavaScript or something to be able to run this on, um, you know, the, the front end of a website and then plug into like the one of the the, you know. Generative AI yeah. um, tools to sort of amazing to think how it's yeah. all coming together and people are able to just sort of yeah now it's put pieces to say, together but yeah the thinking and piece it together it's um I still feel that um, although people can do it what was the the analogy I used the other day it was something on LinkedIn and I was like look just because everyone has a camera doesn't make everyone a photographer. Mm, yeah <laughs> like that's the thing it's like everyone's like oh my god everyone's gonna be designing amazing things and like we're not gonna need movie um you know producers anymore it's just, you know, it's like, did you see the the stormtrooper on the beach yeah i did <laughs> yeah 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 the, that vacuuming in the beach yeah, yeah that's, that's yeah, the yeah, um, yeah. nvidia um yeah, the, the yeah. nvidia text to video stuff yeah it's pretty wild um it's really wild and there's yeah. the other one, the teddy bear playing guitar. Did you see that one? Yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. looking like I was pausing it and looking at the fingers and like the way it was standing and it was pretty. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Strong. They're doing some some incredible stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, so you think that movie producers should be worried? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, you know, I don't know if you'd be able to create a full movie out of that sort of stuff because you've got this sort of like, you know, character consistency, temporal consistency. Um, and I mean, it could probably use it for like animated, animated film creation. But I mean, even then, um, I think you still need, as we sort of said before, you need creative people to, to, to drive that stuff. I think what, what yeah. it might do is kind of like how the digital camera opened the world up mm. to more people. Like it sort of lowers the barrier to entry, I think is the interesting yeah. thing. So, so, you know, potentially instead of these, um, these giant, you know, I mean, probably all was going to have giant film productions, but I mean, I feel like it's going to sort of allow more people, like smaller groups of people to create cool content. And I think yeah. that's, that's, that's an interesting thing, right? Yeah, yeah. that's it. And so, um, yeah, look, I think, uh, the, um, there's a lot of people concerned. I think it'll, it'll, um, my, my feeling at the moment is it's, this is just an emergent technology and this, there are always, well, you know, like I shared something with my boys, my sons the other day about the protests around the calculator, calculators in school. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen <laughs> that. I was like, no. And then there was also the other one about bank tellers, you know, so they're protesting the, um, the, the, um, the, the ATM machines when they first came out. Um, and look, I don't, when I say these things, it definitely doesn't separate, um, you know, legitimate concern in some areas that I think we should all be very concerned about. There's no doubt. Um, but I definitely think it's, it's sort of navigating that middle ground. Right. And, and, um, listening to, um, what's his name? Sam GPT four is the CEO. Sam, Sam, Alden. Alden. Sam Alden the other day. Um, 
you know, talking about how, how and why they've released these models the way they did. And I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting, right? Like giving people a chance to, to catch up, you know, because there's always been a churn of, of roles, you know, they, they've, um, they've always been created and disappeared over time. It's just, I think what we're faced with is a sudden jolt of lots yeah. of roles being changed or replaced or disappearing very yeah. quickly. Yeah. I think so, it's that, that sort of rate of disruption is is kind of the thing that has people um, maybe mm -hmm. a bit worried because, you know, there, there's a report, I think, from Goldman Sachs talking about the number of people that could be displaced with with some of the, the tech progress. I think it was something like 300 million people, um, you know, in, in working roles. And I was, was um, you know, reading some stuff about what's happening in China with the rise of generative AI. And, and you know, there's, there are, like, there are people, you know, obviously that who are losing their jobs um, as mm. a result, because, um, but I mean, that's, it, it's, it's sort of, that's what happens every time there's technological progress as well, right? Totally. What's your concern, JJ? What, what's your concern about um, AI? Or do you have a concern? Yeah, I'm, about... I'm, look, I think, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think the difference between where we are today and you know all the other times throughout history that that there's been disruption is that we've never had a um a tool that starts to challenge or well, starts to meet the level of human intelligence or even surpass it in certain ways like so i think that's that's maybe the 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 key difference at this point in time is, is, you know, um, when you look at uh, GPT-4's ability to, like, like its critical analysis ability is kind of next level. Um, like, you know, you can give it uh, a page of text and ask it to critically analyze it and give you a summary or pick out in interesting pertinent points. It'll do it better than a human and it'll do it in about two seconds. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that's that's kind of... I guess that's a that I I can understand why that's a bit scary to people, and I think it is a little bit. You know, it does does make you go, hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> like, yeah. where to from here? So, so I, I don't know. Um, well, I think I mean, we, just to narrow in on that, like I mean, Dave and I, um, you know, a lot of the research and effort. Like, I mean, because this is the thing. It's like not everyone who has a camera is a photographer. Um, everyone has the ability to, to spark up a podcast, right? Um, you know, but not everybody does. Like this process that we've been through on this, it's like we, we started this conversation in um, November or December last year, I think, Dave, where it was just like, look, I think what's the, what's the, the um, maximum impact, minimum effort thing we can do to just, just start doing something cool that we're going to enjoy. Hmm. And it was like, well, look, we have good conversations let's do that you know and from that decision point to actually getting to here like we did four you know muck around episodes on twitch that you know gave us a spectrum of what we knew was good and what we knew was shit <laughs> you know and then and but using that that we used um uh, gpt 3.5 and 4 a lot through that process just bouncing ideas a lot right and it was able to do things like um you know, uh, summarize enormous amounts of, of information as we started to, to train it, you know, um, you know, also. But what, what, wasn't it listening at the transcript? So you run something. Well, no, that's my next step. I want to start okay. um, running yeah, yeah. transcripts through um, the, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, through or train it with the transcripts. But regardless of that, you're still, it probably the quality of the output of this has been impacted dramatically, right? Like I think we're, we're in a good spot now to do this. We've built understanding through that interaction with AI faster. Um, nothing that we've gone through here has been generated by AI, like none of the questions or anything, but we did ask it for inspiration based on the conversations we've had because, and, and look, I, I think, that's sort of in, indicative of how this co-creation process is going to run. Yeah, right? and, I, and I mean, you know, like the way I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys do similar, but the way I, I use GP, like chat GPT a lot is I'll have a thought about something and then I'll, I'll ask it what it thinks. Mm -hmm. And like, it'll give me 
like it's really good to riff with because you're like totally. you're like i wonder about this and you ask it it's like gives you a whole bunch of things you're like oh i didn't think about that or that it's that's, always that's, there that's, it's always listening and yes yeah, it's super, super useful <laughs> and so i think that that kind of levels up our own abilities significantly right because it's really you know, it, it's really like having a, a super smart friend that you can just like yeah. ask questions. <laughs> like, it is. like yeah. you know, and, and, it, and then never get annoyed at you asking questions at 3am about some dumb shit you just thought yeah. about, like, it's just, it's just there, right? You know, I, I like it when you are, when you say, Hey, I've, I've written this, what do you think? Or whatever, like, cause I'll, I'll, I'll write a piece of a body of text and ask it to proofread or say, Hey, what do you think of this explanation? And when it gives you a pat on the back, you're like, Oh, shucks. That's good. <laughs> no, like, it's very well written. Maybe yeah. you could try blah, but no, it's quite a good yeah. piece of work. You're like, yeah. Yeah. Well done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, thanks for validation. Have managed it to get, I have managed to get it to give me, you know, critical feedback before, but you're right. Like, I think you have to be quite careful with making sure it does it. Because it seems well, yeah, to like, 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 I think, I think if, you off, I like, if you say to it, critically analyze the following piece yeah. of work, it does, a, it does a pretty good job at that. Um, it does in a really polite way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It, 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 won't, it won't poo poo you too much, no. No, that's it. Look, you might you might actually be able to help us out, JJ. I, I don't have any developers in my in my network at the moment, but I do want to. Um, I've just been looking at the API docs for GPT four. Um, I don't think we can actually do it in GPT four um, yet, but the fine tuning. I, I would like to um, to get the transcripts from these. Uh, these um these podcasts and, and feed it back in so i can actually bring that ai in as like an a, you know a co um facilitator some you know another entity involved in this that can actually join the conversation we can ask it questions it's not going to talk to us live but it, it will learn as we go it's kind of an interesting idea maybe you could get it to talk to you live maybe look I, I've, I'm, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm running I'm, locally I'm, cool. auto, I'm running locally auto gpt yeah. Um, and I'm getting quite good um, outcomes from it. Like I've got about I'm up to like my fourth instance now, um, and the the memory component I'm struggling with because my technical knowledge is limited. Um, you know, it, it's it's getting there, but I, I don't have the time to figure it out. But I think the um, yeah the <laughs> it, it does have a voice component in there as well in Auto GPT. GPT they built it in. Um, so it's pretty pretty interesting where it's going, but yeah, I think maybe it could have a voice. <laughs> yeah, it, it could. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, because you, you like, I guess it'd be it, the problem is it wouldn't be like you could rapid fire back and forth. You'd have to be like, so what do you think, ChatGPT? And then then you'd have to give it a few seconds to like do the thing and then convert to audio and then talk. But I mean, I reckon that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, maybe if you if you um, I don't know. Um, in the dunny, as we say in Australia, or the shower late, you know, one day, and you, and the idea comes to your mind, you think, you know what, I should introduce those guys to this guy. And, and, yeah, sure, you know, I'll have a think. Let us know. Yeah. That'd be cool. Because like, it literally, like, uh, for me to spin these things up, um, it, it doesn't take that long, but I just don't have time to support it or, or troubleshoot it or, you know, and um, it would be great to be able to run a couple of these experiments and just see what we can get out of it. And, yeah, uh, cool. But look, I think um, a few more questions. Where are we now, Dave? So it's it's uh, five past eight in the in the AM. We still got a bit of time. Um, I think just in line with our the 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 mission for this podcast, and you know, we're, we're talking to creative visionaries, people that are you know the builders, the hackers, designers. They're wanting to create things, right? And um, we're trying to place it through the lens of you know, uh, building a, um, uh, you know, a better future for, for our kids, essentially, not just, um, you know, uh, profit and, and, and output. And so um, with that being said, I'm just going to, there's a few more questions I'll ask, but I mean, before I narrow it down into that lens, I'd like to know a little bit more about the challenges you face, like growing your team, like, you know, because this, this is Australia, right? We've got we're on the other side of the world, <laughs> you know, we're not in Silicon Valley. Um, that it's, it's not enormously different, but it is different down here for us, you know, and, and we've got, um, uh, you know, additional things to consider when we're building our teams and yeah, maybe you could just riff on that for a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so 
I think we've actually been pretty lucky on that front. Um, I think that there's a lot of talent here in Australia and maybe there's not that much in the way of really exciting projects for people to, to, to be involved in. Like there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot of, I guess, you know, fintech and healthcare and insurance and kind of bit drier sort of um, industries to get involved in, in terms of, you know, people with technical skill sets, you know, obviously we hire a lot of developers and people in the ML space, but I think there's not that much or not as much as, you know, in Silicon Valley, there's, there's all the, all those exciting startups in, mm -hmm. you know, in generative AI and all the other bits and pieces that are going on there. And I think that there's just, um, there isn't as much here. And so I think, you know, there's been a lot of people that we've hired and interviewed, like interviewed and hired who've said like, oh, this is the coolest thing I've ever interviewed for. You know, I really want to work with you guys. And so there's a lot of excitement around that because it's, awesome. it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really cool space to be working in. So we haven't, yeah, we haven't had you know too much trouble finding, um, finding people growing the team. I'm, um, you know, probably the constraint was more around the, the capital for actually, um, for actually hiring and, and being able to have the the runway to support, um, you know, because we're now at twenty seven people on team, so it's a pretty yeah. pretty big team. Um, All in Australia or like some distributed? Yeah, so two of our co founders are overseas. Um, Ethan's in Florida and Sammy's in Spain, um, but um, and our marketing team are sort of uh, Central and South America as well. But our um, our dev team um, is predominantly like Australian, yeah. That's um, right. East Coast, and we're all remote work at the moment, um, you know, which which works pretty well. A few of us in Sydney, and also spread around the East Coast. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's um, um, yeah, we you know, and and like we're we're just in the process of closing out our seed round now, so so that's that's gone really well. Um, we, um, uh, yeah, yeah I don't think I can I can actually name who's sort of leading the round yet because it needs to be announced properly, so I won't I won't do that. But um, yeah, you know, we've we've well, congratulations. Yeah, Good cheers, way. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, but, but sort of, yeah, to, to, to your question, I think, um, you know, the things to think about when you, when you're looking to, to start a company and grow a team is, is, you know, obviously, um, if you've got an interesting, interesting product and interesting angle, um, I think that's, you know, that's very attractive to people. Uh, and, and I think, you know, just creating, creating good, good company culture is obviously, you know, a big, a big part of, um, a big part of, you know, being able to, to draw good people in and keep them there as well. Yeah. What, what do you think? Could you, would you be able to summarize what creates good culture in a company? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, like not, you know, there's, there's some people, I mean, it's less and less prevalent now, but I mean, there's some people that sort of take this very old school view to, to company structure and, and, you know, very kind of like top down, um, you know, um, hierarchies and that sort of thing. And I think it's, it's far more, um, you know, conducive to, uh, to sort of think of, think of it as like a, you know, a big collaborative team where, where everyone has, has, you know, something valuable to contribute and, um, you know, championing good ideas from anyone in the team. Um, and, and, you know, also not expecting people to, to do sort of, you know, crazy overtime and all that sort of stuff. It's just, you know, if, if people are excited and interested, they might, they might work a bit, a bit, do a bit more, but I mean, it's, you know, having that as an expectation, I think is, is not, not great um, as well. Yeah. And then uh, probably, um, you know, those ideas, there's a, there's a cross section between those, those ideas and, and trust to, to reach the, the goal set, right? Like, um, you know, yeah, doing, not micro managing job, people. You know, I would right. you to do your job. You, you're great at this job, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goals, yeah. Let's, let's get there. I think, um, you know, I think from from my experience, that the companies that, um, you know, as a consultant, you know, I, I often come in or previous to the full time role I'm in now. Um, you you'll see those scenarios where it's um. <clears throat> I suppose there's a level of anxiety in middle management, right? And, and it sort of leads to this, this micromanagement that can really be stifling, you know, and then people start to doubt themselves and the, um, you know, and then the, the, the best work cannot be done. <laughs> yeah. That. And I, I think it's just, you know, I think that like the best way to, to handle that stuff is, is to, 
you know, have accountability, but not micromanage, right? It's sort of mm. like, here's, here's the stuff that needs to be done. Let's just check in on where, where that, where that get to, but don't mm. like, you know, I think micromanaging is just a waste of time, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, it's stifling, like you said. Yeah. yeah, that's it. You can't have your finger in every pie or touch everything. Yeah. I think that the other thing as well is, um, you know, strong communication, um, mm. between, especially if you're a remote work team, you have to, people need to be kept in the loop or, or they won't be happy. You know, if, if, uh, especially if something affects them or impacts them, right. Yeah. Do you have, any- I, I wondered how you manage the manage like over 500,000 people in a discord, like that community manager or the people moderating that discord would be an intense job. Yeah. Very- I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of volunteer moderators as well. And, um, you know, there's a lot of like kind of bots that sort of manage people spamming and all that sort of thing and you know, auto, auto yeah. ban them or block certain kinds of yeah. things being posted and yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of stuff. There. <laughs> yeah, Did sure. you have a, um, or, or who maybe a better question is, um, who is um, managing the design component of your, what does, what does that team look like or that structure look like? Yes. Yeah, so there's, the... there's two designers, um, working, working on the project as well as sort of, I'm CEO, but I'm also, I guess, product owner. So I drive a lot of the. I guess product decisions in collaboration with the with the designers. Yeah. Sure, sure. Is there a product manager between you and the designers, or just just you? Not at the moment. Yes, yeah. you're a product manager as well. Yeah, gotcha. Cool. And you and you mentioned um, you mentioned that you you know capital was one of your challenges. Um, do you feel confident um, talking about your potential revenue models? upcoming yeah i mean i mean look what we 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 have monetization in place um already we've kind of soft monetized um in that this is something i'm sorry and i need to say this i i um i did have a play with the platform but dave is the one who's gone deep yeah that's okay yeah yeah no no, that's fine um yeah so we we've 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 soft monetized as i said which which sort of means we haven't really optimized for monetization as yet um our model uh we have I guess really two things at the moment. One is um, it's sort of a, a SaaS model. You know, you sort of as a user can subscribe um, for a monthly fee. You get certain allowances, certain features that are gated um, by the by the monthly plans. And um, you know, we haven't released team plans yet. That's something that's coming. It gives you sort of shared workspaces and collaborative environment. And in addition, um, we have a sort of application. Um, layer uh, API coming to, which is more for like people who want to, to crypt to build third party applications and leverage our API. And awesome. so that's, that's sort of like a pay as you use sort of model. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, that's a kind of, um, revenue model. Yeah. yeah gotcha. So tell, maybe, um, your creative process, cause you're the product owner, right? Like, and, um, like how are you currently, um, you know, uh, prioritizing your, your features before it goes to the designers, like you've got. Is there, is there just a problem in the system or you've got something, how, is, how are you actually? Yeah. So, so there's, uh, it's a good question. There's obviously things that we know that people want. Mm. Um, there's things that we want to build as well that are sort of, um, about expanding the feature set on platform. Um, and there's things that sort of meet our, our strategy of, um, the sort of you, I guess the segments of the user base that we want to focus on and build on, build upon. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of both user feedback as well as just overarching vision, sort of driving those decisions. Yeah. yeah gotcha. And then your, your designers, they, um, I'm really um, curious at the moment about, uh, uh, Jason Freed, um, you know, 37 signals. I'm not sure if you're aware of him. He, um, launched a free, um, uh, ebook, uh, I think it's called, Sh- uh, shape up. And um, I found that quite quite interesting. Hey, in in terms of um, how he is, uh, you know, working with his design team to, to shape these problems, and and like, um, you know, how how do you um, go from prioritizing that? Do you work with the designer, like co-design, or do you um, give them the challenge, leave them leave them with it? They they rapidly wireframe before it comes back, or are they jumping straight into high fidelity? How do you work? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we have an established, like we, we, we have an established like look and feel for the platform. So, um, I think like the way that, that we're sort of working at the moment is really, I'll sort of lay out the fact, like the, 
fundamentals of the feature that we want to build and then one of the designers will take that on and they'll go and um, do a first pass which which is sort of I guess uh, high, high fidelity um, yeah because straight into it. We, they, they get straight into it and then from there it's sort of like a iterative um, feedback process gotcha. to get it to to yeah. production ready yeah because yeah, you've got an established design system I suppose so it's just yeah like, yeah, yeah exactly cool cool great well look um, I think we'll shuffle on to some of these other questions so i think yeah favorite projects on the platform or the most interesting so what's yeah, been yeah. some of the most interesting use cases maybe tying it well, you don't have to tie it actually let's just say what is the most interest one what is the most interesting project you've seen um or concepts come out of leonardo and or um you know what projects might um, be used well, in this I context? Use case, like I mean, you, you've, yeah. seen, you've seen the output used in games, and um, you know, like what's what's maybe the most in your eyes, it might be the most successful um, or the most interesting, right? Like, what what's the project that comes to mind? Um, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of different people like using it in different ways. I think um, uh, there's you think yeah I, I mean i mean you know we've we have um we have one company who we're working with um i can't name them is it because i don't think they've dropped anything publicly but um they're building a uh to start with a a, a sort of a, a game a text to game builder that allows you to basically this is for, for for creating sort of a trading card game allows you to um fill out the like the rules in like a notion document for the game, how it's supposed to work and the theme and so on. And, and basically from there, um, they tap into our API to generate the visual content. And then um, they've, they've already built all these systems that can take, uh, that can be sort of like modified by AI to match your particular um, rule set that you create. So it basically allows you to go and be like, oh, cool, I wanna play I want to play a trading card game in the theme of, I don't know, Battlestar Galactica. And then you can go and fill out the rule set for how you want it to work. And, you know, each player gets X number of cards and then it's this kind of card game and it does blah, 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 blah. And so what they do is they, they take all that input and then they, um, they'll give you back a playable game visually themed the way that you've asked for um, with the rule set that you asked for. That's pretty interesting. Um, it's case. very interesting. Yeah, so I cool. Know, I don't know. Part part of me just goes, "Oh my god!" Like this yeah, mind so no, mind was spinning too at the same time. I'm trying to think of like these things that you might be able to bring to life. It's amazing. No, that's it. It's just what what are the impacts, right? Like it's that again. It's that you you're um, you're automating a whole um, you know production flow rather than just part of it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's sort of the, the the level up, right? Like you could almost imagine doing something like that with a movie, right? So, hey, yeah, I, I want to watch a movie if... in the style of Kill Bill, um, yeah. you know, that is, you know, um, anime and the main characters are all rabbits. Um, totally. But I want to play a cameo and nobody's using swords, they're using cucumbers. It's like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I, I feel I feel like that's I feel like like that to the quality of a feature film is probably like still a number of years away. But um yeah. Well but I mean but th this is it. Okay, so and I, I look once I heard the definition of the ultimate goal of a game would be to make somebody like to to draw out the same emotions as a movie to make them mm. be able to cry, right? That's yeah. it. Like if you can, yeah. if you can get a game to, to, to make someone cry rather than cry out of frustration, cry out of emotion, you know, then you're on the right track. Right. And I think, um, it seems like we're pretty close with a lot of these games. I, I mean, some games already achieve that, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not much of a gamer, right? Like it's done. It's pretty cool ones. Like I don't know if you've ever, like, if you heard of Detroit become human, becoming human, I think it's called Quantic dream makes some awesome games. They're all, PlayStation exclusives and they're kind of very narrative heavy I feel yeah. like you're playing an interactive movie kind of thing That's, you know like yeah. deal with really like adult themes kind of like you know like yeah. really interesting sort of stuff that that was a really cool one because that's about a uh and sort of uh 
androids becoming sentient, becoming conscious, yeah. and like, and their interaction with humans and all that sort of stuff. That's that a super long notion doc. There's a hell of a lot yeah. of pages in that notion doc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, but um, but but, 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 but I mean, you, you, you're right. And but I think, I think you know, an interesting question maybe to ask though as well is if we get to a point where you can curate your own individual experience and it becomes kind of like the holodeck thing from Star Trek, where you know, you can basically be like, cool, transport me to 1920s New York and I want to be in a detective film noir and I want to be the main character. Like if you can do that kind of thing, is that, is that, a, is that a, is that a good thing? Because the, the question, the, the reason my question is, I was having conversations on about this is if we all end up having our own curated personal experiences, um, do we lose a sense of, shared culture because we are we're it dialing in a lot of things um you know yeah um, you know you kind of like how social media puts us all in our own bubbles and our own <laughs> reinforces our own biases and our you know that sort of um you know just does, does that same thing does that extend that that problem so that like you're only experiencing the world in the way that you want to <clears throat> that you want to experience it it becomes too personally curated and maybe that's bad for human humanity in general. I don't know. I think these, the are, and these are the questions, right? Like, um, you know, and, and, a, and a huge reason why, you know, Dave and I wanted to to put this this lens of, um, you know, we we we're, we're mm -hmm. thinking in terms of the. Have you seen the UNESCO um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals? And we're trying to look at what we're doing through that lens, right? Like, AI ain't going anywhere. Right. Technology is not going anywhere, but these questions that you're asking are the things that I'm really, really, really interested in. Right. Like this is, um, and you know, but you don't want to, um, you also don't want to have conversations that, that, um, instantly jump into signaling that you're a, you know, a wildlife warrior and, and here to save the planet, you know, because it's, it's not, it's not helpful. Right. And, um, and so, you know, that's the goal. So I think that's a really, really good question. I, you know, all of the cultural um, experiences we have, all of the experiences we have are built on the pain and suffering you felt at different times. And if you remove that, it's like, what, what is it? It's like, why would anyone step into a holodeck and choose to go through pain and suffering? It's like, it's as, like, as well as there's multiple dimensions of a personality in general. So, and the whole, the whole concept of interacting with other people is that people have other dimensions of their personality. And so then if you're curating your own like story, then you are not um, like interacting with other dimensions of other personalities. You're just interacting or refeeding your own personality. Perhaps that's, that might be a concern. And look, I think this is where, you know, once we've started to figure out a picture of what can be regulated, that that's where regulation is going to probably have to step in. Right. Um, you know, yeah. into the entertainment industry. It's like... But I'd say, I, 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 I don't know if you'd see, I mean, I don't think you'd see regulation say, well, no, you can't have a, a fully personally create, curated experience. I don't think they'd be able to justify that. Like, you know, yeah, like, no. like, well, yeah um... I, I, I think it's just, it's probably going to happen. And it's, it's just, what's that going to mean for, um, well, it might not be know. about the, the curated experience itself. It might be the time you spend in a curated experience right like or or um you know i mean like, like china's like, band i think didn't they like stop stop kids from playing games after x o'clock at night yeah or TikTok. They're, they're only allowed on TikTok for a certain amount of time per day you know it just shuts it down they just leave it on for us it's like, yeah <laughs> but, but, I mean, but i mean that that's like you know again that that applies to kids not adults right and uh you know Totally. Adults aren't great at regulating themselves sometimes. Oh, in fact, I'd argue that um, I, in a lot of cases, I'm worse than my kids. That I just look at them and go, you guys are absolutely amazing. I can't believe that. Like, <laughs> you, you came from me? <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, okay. you're like, Dad, it's time to go outside. You're like, no, nah, I just got to do a bit more. <laughs> oh, it's more like, Dad, come on, we got to go to school. It's like, just one more, just, just uh, like one more wave. Come on. I'm the one running out one more. They're like, Dad, we've got to go. <laughs> so should we, should we, um, I always wanted to sort of have this concept of closing out the, um, you know, the conversation with some regular questions and, um, you know, just posing a couple of questions to you, JJ, and seeing, um, you know, just summarizing what your answer might be. Kind of put you on the spot a little bit. Hopefully it's not oh, too no, challenging. All good, all good. Yeah, so um, 
there's two questions. The first is, um, if there was a problem you could solve, what would it be? And the let's, let's pause there. Let's pause there. Let, okay. Let's stay, stick with that one for now. Okay. Yeah. Sure. If there was a problem, I could say. If, if there was, if there was a particular problem, like just a thing, um, anything, like there's a big, big global problem, a world yeah, problem, sure. a personal I mean, problem. Yeah. Climate change, easy. Like, you know, if I could solve it, if I could press a button, be like solved climate change. Yeah. How would, okay. how would, how would you do it? Well, I, I mean, like, like if this is an if, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Lots of money. <laughs> do, you feel, do you feel then that um, that like this technology helps us march forward? Because look, um, you know, without cracking open that tin of worms, I'm not going to go into the whole proof of work, proof of stake conversation um, about you know energy usage, technology advancing, blockchain technology, and whatnot. Um, but do you feel that you know? AI could play a role in that somehow. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think I think um, I have a friend who was working. Um, so you, you know the the giant what's it called the the giant solar project in the Northern Territory that was sort of backed by Mike Cannon Brooks and Twiggy Forest. They, they've now had a falling out, and they were talk, talking about building this enormous um, solar panel project there, which is going to send power to Singapore. And I think I think the project's still going ahead, but there's some fighting over how it's going to be structured. Um, so a friend of mine was working with a company that was going to be involved in that and and their whole thing was like automated rollout of these solar panels so it was about robots that could go out and like drill the holes in the ground so they could go and put the pylons in so they could go and mount the panels and and that sort of thing you know requires robotics and ai and all that kind of stuff and i think that um you know like like moving the ai needle forward helps us with these large scale projects that are necessary to be able to solve this sort of problem. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's definitely a big part to play there. In terms well, I think of, in, even yeah. um, probably zooming out a little bit um, with the right amount of data, how we solve the problem is building a, a solar array and, and, and putting a cable under the ocean to Singapore, the right idea. <laughs> It might well, be able to help. It might be able to help with some alternatives. You no, know? But, but I mean, I mean, I read a thing the other day. Basically, Australia has the ability to provide, like, I think, like ten percent of the world's power or something. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if we really ramped up our renewable energy production, um, we could do a lot. Um, but I think you know, there's obviously barriers to that, and there's a lot of a lot of cost, a lot of infrastructure build required. Yeah. Um, and and so I think that you know, automation AI can play a huge part of that. Yeah, um, and understanding the broader yeah. problem or problems, and just helping to um, yeah, logistically yeah. Um, roll it out, you know, with with a plan and um, yeah, yeah, you know, and, then, you know, and, and, yeah and and yeah, and, and at the at the more granular level, thinking about the robotics required to be able to do things in an yeah. automated fashion, because we have a huge amount of land, we have a huge amount of sun, um, we can do a lot with that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's it is a really interesting space to um, to have time to focus on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, also always asking myself why we're not further down that track with um with solar in this country but you know i don't know enough about that problem that yeah hopefully this this podcast gives us a bit of time to to zoom in on stuff like that and and become more familiar uh because yeah as designers we that's what we're here to do right Help solve. so then so then that leads into the last question knowing that you know um, yes, we are designers and we go through this two-part process where we might design things in action using design tools, design methodologies. What what design topic interests you most and or what would you, if you were a fly on the wall, what would you like to see designed in action? That's a good question. Um, I think... Well, uh, I mean, I can tell you what interests me most at the moment. Um, because it's it's something that we need to we need to do work on on our, on our platform, which is actually the user onboarding process and familiarizing users with how to use the platform. Because we don't currently have um, a good process for that, and and, and I think uh, you know, especially when you're working with um, uh, with with sort of relatively new tech, um, people don't have a strong understanding of. Um, it's contingent on you to sort of educate people, and and so I think that's that's really interesting to me. And you know we've been we've been doing a lot of work to actually think about how we build out our um, user onboarding flow and and how best to communicate to users how to use different things and what's possible with the platform because there's so many different ways you can use it. 
um, we need to do a lot in terms of the education piece. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, well, look, I mean, that's that's um, food for thought, right? Like, if we were to consider that for this this upcoming workshop, uh, you know, as a potential, uh, you know, um, a topic to to zoom in on for you know practical experience for people that might inter be interested in that as well. You know, we might cover things like uh, defining the uh, key personas, the like draft personas, doing, you know, a, a top level story map, you know, or, or a customer journey and uh, really narrowing in on what those steps are and, and possibly a, you know, a research exercise to look at how other people are handling the same problem, you know, because I think it, it for for um, designers, a lot is about just that rapid research and alignment piece, right? And, and you know, so maybe we could do something where we, we you know, rapidly kick off a project um, focused on user onboarding, map out those, those users, the journeys, uh, you know, a bit of a research exercise and then alignment piece where we actually bring the team back together to, to, to collect the research and decide what the next steps are. All, all within an hour or two. Yeah. Oh, no, I can, we can do it. We yeah. can do it. That, that's the challenge. That's yeah, the yeah. challenge. We can do it. Right there. Like it's not going to be perfect, yeah. but it's going to be a start, yeah. right? And that's, yeah. Uh, that's what this is all about. Cool. No, that's um, been really, really fun. Um, I hope you guys had uh, enjoyed it. Um, yeah, that was, there was great. Thanks, thanks for thanks for having me. It was, it was great to chat with you guys, and uh, you know, a lot of interesting topics covered. I think. Any any closing thoughts you want to share with anyone who wants to get um, involved in generative AI? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I guess just start playing with stuff. There's there's so much out there. Um, you know, I think I think it's uh, I think ignoring it or hoping it's going to go away isn't isn't really. Um, a solution. I think it's you know generative AI is here to stay. Um, learning how to how to use it and how to leverage it to to benefit your you know whatever it is that you do, um, or even just to have fun because it's mm. it's lots of fun to play with. Um, yeah, certainly is. What about getting involved with Leonardo? AI. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, like like um, you know join our Discord. Uh, we have a we have a, a, a there's there's a there's a pretty big waiting list to get on platform, but if you if you sign up and if you join our Discord and introduce yourself there, you can actually fill out a priority application form, and that'll that sort of that's that's the way to get on the platform quickly. Um, awesome. And tell yeah. tell them you I uh, heard about it on this podcast. So you get like super priority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no. totally. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks so much, JJ. And look, podcast one, the pilot episode. Done. Done and dusted. Done and dusted. Thanks, cool. guys. Thank you very much. Go and oh look, someone someone's gonna be having a beer somewhere. Just not here. Uh, <laughs> all right guys. So yeah, it's, it's beer o'clock, eight thirty. Yeah. <laughs> In Australia. Oh well, yeah, it is Friday. It is Friday. <laughs> um, so we're gonna stay on the line. Uh, that was a super fun conversation. It was a eh? it was uh yeah, much better than I expected for our pilot. I'm really, really happy with that, Dave. So I think yeah. uh, the the next steps just to wrap up. We are going to be running a collaborative design exercise next Friday. Not too sure what it's going to look like yet, but we will let everyone know. It may be something to do with generative AI and onboarding. Uh, journey knows? mapping. Who journey knows? Mapping. But this is the concept. We, we put, we've got to ideate quickly and put it together and come That's up it. with the results. So this is a great exercise. We're going to be doing something fun, doing something live. And if you want to be involved, you can. Uh, we've got a Discord. Unfuck by design. Dave's going to chuck it in the description for whatever platform you're watching this on. And yeah, while you're there, like and subscribe. Come and say hello. Let us know what you think. Cheers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, and that's a good point before you hang up. Um, if it was shit, tell us it was shit. <laughs> I don't mind. Tell us what part was good. Um, you know, give us feedback. We want to know. Bad feedback is good feedback. That yeah, helps you improve. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, I'll be, go, go a little bit easy. Don't make it personal. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't hurt anyone, anyone's feelings. But yeah, negative feedback. See you soon. Okay. See you.